Hello. Dan and Ivy are back with our Not So Giant Women podcast for Steven Universe Chats. So today we're jumping into the strange and spooky episode, Horror Club. So something tells me this is no secret team. <laughs> no, I mean, it's hard not to be reminded of the Twitter parody account, the Midnight Society. I doubt it'll go there, but I can't help but be reminded. Ooh, I don't have context for that. Midnight Society Twitter? It's a Twitter account that supposedly tells the adventures of parodic, childish versions of various classic horror writers of many eras gathering to tell each other their stories. And they're all hyper-exaggerated versions of what they are. H.P. Lovecraft can't go two minutes without picking on Italians. Edward Lee oh. is obs- obsessed with well-naked women, mostly. <laughs> I think that you mentioned this one other time and I just didn't put it together with that name. So I probably just forgot. But I guess I just don't stay up to date with the horror stuff. So this is out of my comfort zone here, this horror club episode. But it's all part of the whole thing. So I guess I have to deal with it, huh? (laughs) Well, let's find out what the horror club is like. Okay, I'll do it. We are the Crystal Gems. We'll always save the day. And if you think we can... I wasn't trying to make you look bad. Ah, uh, whatever, it didn't matter, I don't care! Hey, Lars. Take it down a notch. Yeah. Okay, didn't expect such a spot on those two characters together this week. Yeah, Uh, the straight-up horror movie setting. Yeah. Okay, (laughs) to recap, Lars is locking up Big Donut when Stephen suddenly appears and asks if he wants to go to a horror movie party. Lars is too cool for this, of course. (laughs) But when Sadie emerges and says that she's going, Lars tags along. Lars mocks the fact that it's been run by Ronaldo and calls him all sorts of nasty things. It's at the lighthouse, of course. At the lighthouse, Ronaldo greets them all spooky style. So Stephen and Ronaldo have obviously mended fences. Yeah. Ronaldo greets them all spooky style in his little ancient tuxedo and Phantom of the Opera mask, but he's alarmed, or at least very surprised to see Lars there. Nonetheless, they all go in and start to watch movies. There's a bit of a bickering over whether or not one is a true fan of movies with remakes and CGs and bears that do or don't eat parts of people. Sadie worries if this movie will be a bit intense for Stephen. Stephen's fine, he says, watching from behind the sofa. (laughs) Just when they're getting to, well, what some of them regard as the good bit of the movie, all the power goes out. And Renato says it could be a fuse or a ghost. (laughs) And just when we're ready to dismiss this as a flight of fancy for Ronaldo, he asks for further signals and there are things like pendant flicking across at Lars and hitting him in the face and files from the filing cabinet going all over the place. This ends up with trying to leave. Ronaldo is admiring the way Sadie is taking charge. However, Sadie is soon taken when the floor just opens up and swallows her in a glow of red light. Ronaldo figures this is a poltergeist drawn to emotional turmoil, which he decides Lars is the source of, which is, well, in that case, is probably a safe guess, having known Lars for more than a minute. (laughs) They descend to the basement where there is a pulsating carving of Lars's name, which pretty much pinpoints him as the target. Ronaldo thinks if they give up Lars to this pulsating soon a mouth in the wall that Sadie will be returned throws Lars into the mouth Stevens or this is a bit much and dives after Lars using his bubble to protect them the source everything is revealed to be a gem an actual one of our gems still in its just a gem form was stuck in the wall as Stephen takes and talks to it Sadie having appeared safe and sound in the rubble of the wall it projects an image from years past of child versions of Ronaldo and Lars. It seems they were or tried to be friends when they were children and they were going to form a, a secret investigate paranormal things club down here in the basement of the lighthouse. And they 
in fact, encountered an early manifestation of the gem. Ronaldo got a Polaroid of it. He is so excited that this is proof there is supernatural things going on, even at this early stage of his life. Lars takes the photograph and tears it up because he doesn't want to be seen as the loser, the victim to this force, doesn't want to be seen as the weak one. Ronaldo is distraught and asks, how can he care so much about what people think? Lars says, if Ronaldo knew what people thought of him, he wouldn't ask that question. The young Lars storms off, leaving Ronaldo to a life of investigating paranormal things to almost never again find the proof of what he's looking for, that there's actual supernatural things happening. So in a way, this means even without what we've seen, Ronaldo had been right all along. He wasn't just pursuing a mad aim. He'd actually seen supernatural things right at the beginning. Ronaldo wants to see the gem. Stephen rather lets it rest and bubbles it away. Stephen and Sadie leave and he says that Ronaldo and Lars have a lot to talk about. And that's this one. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think I expected there was a significant history with Lars and Ronaldo. A little bit of a surprise. She certainly sheds a light on both their characters that, as I said, Ronaldo isn't just picking up notions and running with them. He started this whole thing by seeing supernatural or we know what they are, but he's pretty much spot on that there are forces beyond and he saw them right up close and personal and had the evidence ripped up in front of his face. So he's not just a crusader. He's been in some ways trying to reclaim what he lost all those years ago. Yeah. Wants to be validated. Lars, meanwhile, has been brittle and concerned about his image ever since he was a wee young thing. And yeah, it seems like he may have liked child Ronaldo, but he wanted it to be secret. He was like super specific about mentioning it as a secret club, right, Ronnie? <laughs> yeah. And indeed, he basically gave up his friendship with Ronaldo for the sake of that image he's trying to maintain. Yeah. And they seem to have had very little direct contact since. I mean, Ronaldo's reputation is already spread amongst Beach City, so that's not a surprise. And Lars thinks he's cultivating a reputation as a cool kid. But yeah. 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 They definitely really had both, like, both of them had their personalities very on display this time, with Lars being really pretty cruel in like just mocking Ronaldo and making fun of what he likes and you know trying to make him look bad in front of others and then we have Ronaldo who's being like you're the fake fan I'm a real fan you know this Mm. gatekeeping junk that he does yeah it's back to Lars can be a good person deep down but it's so far deep down you've got to wonder if it's worth plowing through to get there yeah, it is interesting that like right there at the beginning, S- Stephen is telling him who's throwing the party and he doesn't say anything about Ronaldo specifically. He says, oh, that social napalm, like he's thinking of him in terms of where he stands in the social order. And what he can do to one's own position in the social order. Yeah. So he's not saying like, oh, I don't have anything in common with him or gosh, we just don't get along. He's just like, oh, social napalm. I would never want to see seen with him. He goes along because he's still <laughs> trying to pursue his weird damaged relationship with Sadie. Yeah, he doesn't want to be left out. It was kind of funny be- that Stephen and Sadie seemed to have made their plans. They knew what they were going to do. And they're just going off and they couldn't care less if Lars came along. So he- you could see he didn't like that. He didn't like being a take or leave it. <laughs> so he had to enforce his dominance kind of by setting the tone and laughing at Ronaldo's costume which I don't know what he was trying to do the phantom mask was there and then also sort of werewolf hands or something I don't know what was going on with this yeah he's kind of over egging the pudding with sort of too many references in his costume yeah it was cute though like Stephen was really into it he was grinning really big and excited that you know I mean I can imagine when you're a little kid and adults get really into stuff like that you're like oh this is a cool grown up I mean, like he's doing something that's fun and getting into it so you know but yeah like like you said apparently they've mended their relationships like oh you tried to hit me with a potato and kill me but that was when you thought I was a snursen <laughs> yes yeah as we've seen Stephen's attention span on grudges isn't up to much sometimes. Yeah. And regarding Lars, he's like, yeah, isn't everyone friends with Lars? Like, <laughs> Ronaldo's like, that's your friend. He does um, have a bit of a blind spot when it comes to Lars. I think there's seeing the best in someone and then there's just having this 
cap on his perception of Lars and not being able to see the problems with him. Yeah, I think that's very Steven-y of him. He just sees the best in everyone, except maybe Kevin in the Stevani episode. <laughs> he probably can't conceive why Ronaldo and Lars wouldn't get on. Right. It's very interesting that Sadie said at the beginning there, like, nice to finally, like, formally meet you. Sort of, I think that's the gist of what she said, and uh, officially meet you. Yeah, something like that. You just think, like, they've worked basically next to each other as neighbors for however long this is. Who knows how long they've all lived there? And I'm like, y'all don't know each other? Come on. That's that's so funny that they wouldn't have crossed paths. I also wonder if that was a bit of the the writing going, have these two properly met on screen? Oh, I, I'm not going to go back and watch 40 episodes to be sure. We'll just say she's officially meeting him now. Right. Though I guess in their defense, it's, it's kind of character-wise, you think Ronaldo probably spends most of his time doing his weird research. And Sadie, when she's at work, is generally always with Lars. So Yeah, and they're both generally in their places of work. So Yeah. I think every once in a while you see people go into each other's food establishments and eat each other's food. But yeah, I, I don't know. Ronaldo is always trying to get out of work anyway, so he can go spend weird time. <laughs> and Petey works twice as hard for the both of them. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there's another reason not to know Ronaldo. He's just probably not around enough. He's just always finding excuse to pop off to the lighthouse and find a vampire in someone's fence or something. Right, and post about it on anime message boards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Argue about subs or dubs. He didn't mention his blog once this week, so which is kind of right. yeah, which kind of makes him a bit less one dimensional. That he, even though he's still pursuing what he sees as the truth, he's not quite the <laughs> the wacky conspiracy theorist who just talks about his blog and the secrets. He does he does have some depth, which you could be forgiven up to this point for thinking he did not. <laughs> Yeah, I guess the closest thing we've gotten to his presentation is we got to see his his filing cabinet. <laughs> got to see the G drawer, which suspiciously does not have a folder for gems. Just yeah, I think that's his blind spot. That he... <laughs> like, come on, Ronaldo, they're the source of a lot of the weird stuff. Have at least a folder for them yeah. in between, like, gnolls and ghosts or whatever you've got there. <sighs> There's a folder in there for fun size, whatever that is. <laughs> I, guess there, I guess there's a part of him that's blinkered about gems because he doesn't want there to be one nice, easy answer that presents itself to him. He needs to find a complex truth. Yeah. And I guess, I mean, in his defense, he does live in a world that gems have always been kind of back part, part of the background scenery. We still don't really know how much people know about gems in general society, but like, you know, maybe that's just not news to him. <laughs> Yeah, there are gems with space and stuff, but I mean, <laughs> it might be a, it might be a, a poltergeist. It can't be the gems because that's not a weird thing because they're here every day. Right. Although this one, gem-wise, acted very differently. I mean, yeah, we could probably have a good in-depth talk about that. The way that it used the house as, I guess, as its body, if you can see yeah. it the way that it explained it, that was different from anything we've seen. Yeah, we don't know how corrupted or not it was but it didn't have like an animal body as they've usually had mm -hmm. so far and yeah. it's it's very in fact in some ways it is being like a traditional horror movie thing and that's sort yeah. of it's reflecting the feelings and actions of those around it and manifesting based on that if it's that oh that nicely gross pulsating thing where Lars has carved his name and it didn't act up again until, as far as we know, until Lars came back into the lighthouse. And if it really is reacting to strong emotional turmoil, then pointing a finger at Lars is not unreasonable. Yep. It seems fact, like it was fine with letting Ronaldo hang out there and make it his lab or whatever. But once Lars got in there, it kind of woke back up. Yeah. And not for Stephen, who's, you know, as we've seen, just nice to everyone. So he's fine. And it might even know he's also a gem on some level. So that's cool. And we saw an we saw a nice part of Sadie just in that, oh, will this be too much for for Stephen moment? So even though she's young and fun-loving, she's still aware and caring. of And once, once to, she cares for Stephen, she wants to make sure he will be okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Jem Ghost is probably fine with her, but Lars, as we've seen, has issues going all the way down. And especially since it's already got an issue with him because... I say it. I mean, gems so far seem to be she's. Yep. 
And so she's got an issue with him because he carved his name into her body. However, she ended up in the wall of a lighthouse, as they said, it's the influence spread the influence spread through him. She probably liked being a lighthouse because of the gem's fixation with lights and things. So that was probably probably cool she was on whatever level she does think she's probably cool to just hang out and shine lights all day and get the occasional visit from the funny fry-headed man but yeah. Lars, i don't know how got there in the first place but yeah yeah well to be fair we ha- don't really know how many of the gems got to where they are they just kind of are there so i guess whatever it is that scatters gems around put this one in the wall of a lighthouse or someone built a lighthouse around her depending on how long she's been there. Yeah, a lot of unknowns there. And some almost adult level compassion with Stephen saying, oh, let's, let's just let it rest and yeah. but bubbling her back home. Yeah, I just thought of this, but I'm thinking like considering how Ronaldo acted with his watermelons, it's like, well, maybe if I give this to you, you'll do weird experiments on it. <laughs> well, yeah, I think there was a bit of that too. And maybe he thought that it would reform or something like the way that the one gem he's seen murdered with a hollow pearl and come back to life was pearl that maybe he thought this could be an unpredictable person who could just like grow a body and, and come kill us or something, depending on what her affiliations were. Probably. She's fine if you so far, but if you start doing experiments or probing or whatever, that might push her over the edge. So let's just let her have a nap back in the bubblarium. Yeah. It's very, very strange with the influence that she clearly had over just anything that counted as the house, even like the scarecrows outside. And so Mm. it was very peculiar, especially since like, oh, the files were flying around and stuff. It didn't need to be touching anything. It was just all doing her, her whims. Very strange because really, I guess the only other one we've seen that was like embedded in an object was Lapis and she couldn't move. She couldn't do anything. Maybe, so. maybe this gem telekinesis or something like it is her, her Jeez. weapon slash power. Ah, that would be neat. Makes me wonder how much, like whether Lapis had any control over water while she was stuck in there just because she didn't seem to, but in the very ending of when she was in the mirror and Steven was trying to pull her out, the water started acting weird. So it was like just shortly before she reformed. Yeah, and up until that, I don't think she was significantly, other than maybe when Stephen was sitting on the beach, she wasn't really near or yeah. in water. Mm-hmm. It's just It seems like it varies a lot. We don't know really what the rules are for gems that are not in a gem body, that they're stuck in something else. We don't really know how aware of the world they are. And we don't know specifically with this lighthouse gem if she was corrupted. Whereas Lapis was cracked, but not corrupted. Yeah, so we haven't got enough constant to go on. Yeah, so usually we just see them as weird gem monsters that they fight and mm. destroy and bubble. <laughs> yeah, so th- yeah, this was, inter- this was interesting and, and new. Yeah, Ronaldo straight up basically tried to kill Lars in this episode. He picked him up and threw him into that mouth. He was ready to yeah. straight up sacrifice this guy. Yeah, admittedly for Sadie, but it took him all of about a second to decide that. <laughs> yeah. That he was ready to kill and that the world is better for having Sadie in it than Lars. Yeah. And uh, when Stephen tries to save him, he says he's not worth it. <laughs> wow. That's kind of deep. <laughs> like, wow, you've learned that firsthand. And of course, we realized shortly afterwards that he did have a bad experience with Lars. So, <laughs> But obviously, this is the impression you're leaving, Lars, that people are ready to kill you in favor of someone they've known for about an hour. Yeah. It was really uh, kind of hard watching him. What were you saying? Lars really needs to do some work on himself. Yeah. Yeah, he does. See, I think so far, I don't remember him mentioning what his home situation was, like if he lives with parents or if he has any family or what his living situation is. Sadie at least has mentioned her mom dotes on her and gives her mm. lunches and stuff. But, you know, you, you usually would expect somebody to maybe not have a particularly strong life and we don't really know anything about it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we saw his home, but no one, well, we didn't see anyone else who lived in it. So we saw, we saw his home. Where was that? That was him with the trampoline. The cool oh, kids. we saw the star talking about that. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Which at least means that he lives somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So he's he, he's 
his home situation is, isn't so out there that he's, you know, living in Cardboard City or something. He's a, He has a home that is a building. Who else is there with him? We don't know. That's right. Yeah, they haven't we, told us. We don't know how much a donut server makes, so we don't know if anyone's helping him afford that house. <laughs> right. And they haven't been specific about how old these guys are. I mean, they seem to be working during typical kind of school hours so it seems like they'd be older than school but then you have Petey who clearly isn't so <laughs> something's going on there yeah. I don't know I kind of assume that they're adult yeah I've, I've done the same I think with Lars and Sadie they do sometimes lean them closer to older teenagers and sometimes closer to young adults and right so maybe they're still working it out behind the scenes yeah huh. but they tend not to be specific about ages I'm not sure why that is. Yeah, there seems to be a sort of nebulous late teen, early adult age that a lot of characters occupy without niggling it down. I mean, the cool kids are of this age and they're still called the cool kids. Right. <laughs> and, right. and then, and then sort of jump up to an across the board parent age where Mayor Dewey, Greg and others tend to be. Right. That's exactly what I was going to say is, you know, you see the pizza girls and then you see their dad and you definitely see there's a, there's a generation between them. Mm. So, mm. but it really does when you get to those ages, like sometimes it really matters just a few years each way. So it's hard to pin down. Like if somebody is not actually an adult, it's very different than if they could conceivably just like disappear onto an Island for over a week and they just, you know, it's not going to be reporting, reported as a missing child. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> so. I guess Sadie's still in pretty close contact with her mom if she's giving her lunches most days. So even if she doesn't live with her, she's obviously seeing her a lot. Right. Yeah. We don't know if she has that situation, if she's living with her at this point. <sighs> mm. I'm trying to think if there's any clues about it, but uh, mostly it just seems to be like, that she calls her mom and that she has enough contact with her to be expected to feed her. <laughs> mm. So yeah. I was going to talk about the childhood spat that the two kids had. I found it kind of cringy to watch. Like it's really hard to watch them talk about what matters to them. And they're talking past each other, you know, like where Lars just, he doesn't want to be embarrassed. And Ronaldo is completely not listening to that. He doesn't understand why Lars doesn't see this as an opportunity, you know, whereas Lars is like, I'm being smacked by a loose board and looking like a fool. I don't want people to see me like that. And, you know, they couldn't hear what each other's concerns were because they were thinking about what mattered to them. And that was just like, sad because you know they obviously didn't continue to have a friendship after that so yeah, and they couldn't quite comprehend how important each other's thing was to them I mean yeah. Ronaldo said in so many words that he how, how can you care so much about what other people think of you so he's yeah. someone to which it's not that he's unaware that this is the cause of Lars problem but he can't comprehend basing one's own actions and motivations on that. Even at a young age, he's a bit more, oh, I'll do what I'll do and what reputation I get or not will yeah. happen. Whereas Lars has to do something. For him, the reputation is the end goal. And so Lars, yeah. in turn, can't comprehend not maintaining that, not taking action to govern maintain how people see you how, how can you to him how can one value this essential part of one's being so low mm -hmm. I like that the way they presented it you weren't like okay one, only one of them was being the jerk and the other one was in the right you know you could mm. you could understand why they both felt the way they did so I like yeah. that <laughs> although Steven seemed to be on Ronaldo's side for most of the episode that he yelled at Lars like why are you being so, you know I think you should stop being such a dink he said stop being such a dink to Ronaldo although then he went and saved Lars but he seemed to be defending Ronaldo but Lars was attacking so yeah so in out, outside of the childhood spat you've got this fairly fairly clear guess that Lars is what's causing all these things to happen and he's just doubling down rather than saying oh, what have I done? Maybe I can solve this somehow. So mm -hmm. in that sense, that's all on Lars. Right. And even at the end, he's just like, whatever, it didn't matter. I don't care. <laughs> so. 
and we said, <laughs> and we certainly have more of a history of Lars being a jerk. So he's with the child childhood stuff. You can sort of see where they're both coming from. It certainly seems to have more adversely affected Lars's current self than Ronaldo's, at least right. in terms of That's immediate behavior. <laughs> The, uh, the argument they have at the beginning about the horror movie was funny to me because I mean I'm sure you've probably run into it at least as much as I have if not more because you do like horror movies and stuff but like people kind of talking about what makes you a valid fan like ah, I have the original and you know true fan would accept nothing less and it's like this crappy like low-tech version <laughs> right <laughs> yeah and I've definitely been in enough conversations like that of oh my yeah oh regrettably my younger self used to even adopt such an attitude but I hope I've grown oh. up to that so you know <laughs> yes sadly I too was an idiot teenager ah, yeah. at least we all grow from that right yeah. <laughs> and there's a certain deliciousness with knowing an origin you know and it's like I know all the history <laughs> And it's also a very cult movie fan thing to place mm. as much sort of, oh, is this where you see the sound guy? As opposed to anything <laughs> about the actual plot or events of the movie. That was so cute. Do you think that the reference to Evil Bear 2 was anything specific? I mean, I'm not real up on that stuff, but the main thing I think of where toys come to life is child's play, but I can't think of anything else. I also thought just in terms of the title of Evil Dead 2. Oh, uh-huh. Partly also because that's one where the film number two is often seen as far superior to film number one. Oh. And yeah. I did notice that they're talking about Evil Bear 2 and there's no mention of Evil Bear 1 being the original or worth seeing or anything like that. Evil Bear 2 is obviously such an entity of itself that it's the one that gets remade and discussed and watched and that's a very Evil Dead to Evil Dead 2 thing. Oh, I love that. <laughs> If you look at the small print on the box, it says something like, come scream with me tonight yes. or something. Yes, I like that. It I, didn't I, have the subtitle they actually said out loud, but I guess this is more fan posturing. Uh, I read somewhere that that was like a reference to Teddy Ruxpin from the 80s, that come dream with me tonight. I, I guess it has to be because it's a bear, but, you know, that has to be on purpose. But I never had a Teddy Ruxpin because, number one, they're expensive, but number two, they seemed really creepy to me. So, I mean, a talking teddy bear that also, I don't know, wants to eat hermit's legs. That's 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 pretty horrific, even if it's cheesy. <laughs> Yeah, It also reminded me just in general of the kind of creature features that pretty much every animal in the, well, the whole animal kingdom has been the source of a horror movie at some point or another. Oh, <laughs> seemed like seemed like it was a toy bear to mm. me, like probably, right? Did you get that impression? I, I just thought of it as a bear generically, but that could be my... Oh, and it's also... Of, oh. <laughs> mm. So you don't know if that's a cartoon bear... Or if it's a cartoon toy bear. <laughs> yeah, but I was also thinking other creature features because, right. well, even just off the top of my head, well, even just in the other show I do, we've had two about giant right. pigs. So if you've got, you know, sharks and spiders and dogs and Ugh. all sorts of things, then bear, yeah, why not? There's probably, there's probably a real bear creature feature I'm just not aware of right now. Barely alive. <laughs> <laughs> They helpfully narrate, you're eating my leg. <laughs> and Stephen's behind the couch. Oh, I've heard some people interpret his hiding behind the couch as he's just trying not to watch TV because he's still grounded <laughs> watching TV. Oh, for but I think he was scared. <laughs> yeah, I, I think he was scared. But there's probably, I'm not scared. I just find it more comfortable down here. Love it. Actually, I would have liked to see him just completely not be scared at all because he sees real monsters in his regular life <laughs> yeah it's like i could have just pulled out my shield and bubbled that <laughs> so i'm not scared of it <laughs> would have been funny It'd be different to i guess react to such things if you actually fight monsters <laughs> yeah he's probably thinking do none of these people have bubbles or or, or weapons or yeah <laughs> where, where is the gem on this bear <laughs> secretly and behind his eye <laughs> i liked that sadie was secretly a horror movie nerd in this like that she was really into what ronaldo said oh can i see the box you know she was really into it so you know one of her one of her secret interests besides lars and making donuts 
Yeah, I, I believe that. I've discovered there's quite a community of, I suppose, what you might call, it's the best way to put it, girls or women who are sort of apparently demure and polite, but properly into dark and disgusting horror things on a quite nerdy oh. or essential level. So it, would, it wouldn't it would surprise me that she's one of them. Oh, yeah. I mean, considering she's the only one of them there besides Steven who has fought and won against the gem monster. <laughs> yeah. She's hard to scare. She's hard to disturb, I guess. Yeah, well, even this week, Ronaldo admires her just taking charge in a situation, so... Yeah, I like that. It was almost, it didn't go all the way there, but it was almost love triangle right, for a while there, where Lars was monitoring very closely how close they got and who was impressive and who ran down there faster and stuff. So a little bit, wow, these two rather problematic men in Beach City competing for Sadie's attention. It's an interesting vibe. (laughs) Yeah, it's hard to tell if it was a love thing or if Ronaldo was just generally impressed. Yeah. Either way, Lars was finding it to be a violation, like, of his property. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lars, Lars, you are a big problem. Yeah. He's like, hey, only I can treat her like crap. <laughs> uh, Ronaldo seemed to be treating her fine, like, that he respected mm-hmm. her and was kind of elevating her above the others. It's just like, well, after the civilians are safe, I'll, you know, I'm going to come <laughs> yeah. back to you all. The civilians. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's sort of electing her to his secret paranormal hunter group. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's cool that he recognized her competence, I guess, in the situation and keeping a level head and everything. Oh, hello, nurse. Hey, kitty cat. Also, I don't want to forget to mention that I liked Lars's glow-in-the-dark earplug things. Yes, I, I mentally noted them that not only she actually got earplugs in for the first time possibly yeah. ever but that they yeah, so we saw them, saw them like that yeah that they were able to subtly show that they were glow in the dark ones with the color and the light things yeah as they were locking up outside and then there were lots of dark moments in the show itself yeah they showed those which which kind of like that in the horror movie and everything kind of makes it seem almost like this was meant to be a halloween episode yeah that's which, what i was about to say too wondering if it was yeah. supposed to be halloween in story and that was Lars's yeah. thing to it but I guess we didn't really see much else outs- outside of Big Donut to see if there were other Halloween events going on. Right there's certainly no mention of it and no like really obvious Halloweeny stuff there was scarecrows which made it seem like it was a spooky fall thing but that's as close as it got that there was bat props and scarecrows outside and you know then he's got the glow in the dark plugs and they're watching horror movies it just it seemed like this would have been the type of episode that they'd air for Halloween. And in the United States, anyway, I'm pretty sure it aired in like February. <laughs> but it was way off, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, mind you, that happens a lot. I think I was just watching some other show, and I can't remember which one, but the Christmas episode first ran in like July, no, no in like August or something. So it wasn't even Christmas in July. It was just, oh, this. we did a Christmas episode and this is where in the schedule it comes. Oh, well. Yeah, that's the risky run with having episodes that have to be played in a certain order, which this one didn't seem to contain anything that required it to be before or after anything, except that, you know, the characters have to be established. Yeah, I guess at most you have Stephen's power is more, it's obviously something he can do or something that happens when it's supposed to, he's not surprised by it anymore. And Mm -hmm. I I suppose, I suppose Sadie's scar. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep, that was still there. So I suppose those are little things that put it here, but you could also, even where up to that could have been pushed back or Mm -hmm. possibly forward. I don't know because I haven't seen forward yet, but by any number of weeks to keep things going. Right. Right. The scar is the most recent thing that you mentioned because that was episode 30 and the bubbling ability showed up in 23 well bubbling gems and then the big bubble around things way back in episode seven so it's like yeah all those things had to have happened but yeah other than that this seems like one of those episodes that if you wanted to you could run it on halloween again (laughs) it just wouldn't matter it's kind of one of my least favorite episodes of season one just because you know i'm not particularly into ronaldo and lars and stuff and plus it's a horror movie and 
nothing super plotty happens and none of the interaction is really my my favorite stuff but it's you know it's rewatchable <laughs> it's not something i hate watching i do look away when the thing starts pulsating though i just don't like to look at even cartoon veins like that it's gross yeah that was pretty impressively gross i got to say yeah thank you raven and paul <laughs> They got another scary one under their belt. (laughs) Mm. Yeah, Halloween episode-wise, I think there's like two other places where they reference something that could be spun as a holiday without exactly saying it. We still have to come to those episodes, so we shall see anyway. Mm. I'm not a big fan of Lars either, but I have been usually fairly impressed in how they how well they managed to make him seem like a genuinely unpleasant person. Yeah, he's he's partly believable because so many of us have someone like him in our lives. Yeah, yeah. Enthusiastic and gatekeepy kind of trumping themselves up on knowledge and conspiracy theory, gatekeepy male fan. <laughs> it's a certain type, isn't it? And when you see Lars and Sadie together, some of us will get that painful flashback to watching some pair or couple interact and wondering if you've passed the point where you should say something. <laughs> something like what? <laughs> like if like if you shouldn't take Sadie aside and say, look, Lars isn't good for you. I'm not sure he has your best interests or in fact any of your interests whatsoever at heart. <laughs> Yeah. I think you'd be better off not chaining your heart to him so because he's not so much stringing as dragging you along on a dirt road. Yeah. At this point, it might just be a proximity thing. Mm. He sees sees her at work every day and there's a certain vibe. I mean, I guess we've talked about it before in other Lars and Sadie related episodes where certain types of ladies will feel like this guy is my project. I'm going to help him. I'm going to teach him and make him better. And that happened. I mean, that was pretty specifically referenced in Island Adventure when she was saying, why don't you ever let me help you? And what she chose to do to help him was not actually very helpful in that episode, but it kind of seems like she gets something out of letting him be a huge slacker at work and kind of taking up his slack. Yeah. And then feeling like that's helping him or helping him grow somehow, but it probably isn't. He's just Mm -hmm. then taking her for granted. (laughs) Yeah. I suppose. And just trying to think we haven't really seen those two interact with many others besides Steven up till this point. I don't think not to, not to, uh, not to the extent of this week. Mm Mm-hmm. I think you're right. Can't really think of a whole lot of late Lars and Sadie besides, you know, the Cool Kids episode with Lars. Yeah, yeah. And Lars was definitely at full Lars that time. Yeah. Do you think it would be interesting to have an episode with just Sadie? Yeah, I think I think it'd be interesting to see Sadie away away from Lars. Mm-hmm. We've seen more Lars away from Sadie than we have seen Sadie away from Lars. I mean. This week, Sadie was disappeared for half the episode and we had a whole bunch of laughs, whereas Sadie has only made smaller appearances without her co-worker. Yeah, that's true. Thinking of the time that she went to Stephen's watermelons booth outside the fair and very briefly had like a little cameo there where she wanted to support his business and Lars was not there. That's That's typical for the times that we see her around. She's really... They're mostly taken as a unit in this show so far. Mm. So you kind of wonder what her situation is, like what she's dealing with besides him. Yeah, you just want to see, if she, <laughs> yeah. see if she's got a, a bit more to her world. Yeah. So now we know that she's into horror movies, though. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's a nice little piece of personality trivia to add to her. Cool. Yeah, and like mm. I said, I find it totally believable having seen what we've seen of her so far. Yeah fits in very well with what we know. Oh, yeah, it adds a dimension to just like, okay, this is something that she and Ronaldo have, have both expressed interest in now, like talking to each other while Lars is kind of just, he's seen the more mainstream, well-known version. He's not a connoisseur like them. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. I wonder if he is the kind that a uh, person that would be talking over the movie and yelling like, oh, that's that's ridiculous. And how fake can that be? Can that look? And he probably does. You know, he's probably <laughs> trying to make his case that the remake is superior. 
to try to reclaim his credibility that he's only seen that one. Mm -hmm. Follow up questions. What kind of probing question could I ask you this time? How about if I make it about horror movies? <laughs> oh, yeah, let's go. Except it has to be about the show. So human related horror movies usually are tied to like death or monsters. Mm -hmm. What do you think would be a good setting or idea for a horror movie that could make gems be scared? <laughs> Ooh. Might be hard. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a deep probe. <laughs> Maybe a gem horror movie. I wonder if they have movies. Hmm. I think they'd be more playing into the threat of being cracked, their actual gem gem part. Ooh. Yeah. And it's possible the idea of flat out death is in some ways more frightening to a gem because it's so much harder for them to die. Hmm. Because humans tend to last, you know, they start to top out at 100 years, then they just tend to die off anyway, whereas gems don't really age to death and there's no, there's so few of the things that can kill humans can kill them. So in some ways, I think if you took the standard slasher model of something just randomly or suddenly, I should say, killing people and applied it to gems, the idea that something suddenly outside, especially of a known combat situation because we know they've had all kinds of war in their culture that something could just wander around just cracking your gem and killing you for want of a better word stone dead would actually mm -hmm. be pretty terrifying i mean even if you're killed in battle you're at least contextually aware that this is a thing you're, you're risking just by taking part whereas in the slasher model people are usually just going about their lives and so it's probably even more an out of context fear or rather scary for being so out of context to a gem that they could mm. just be taken down mm -hmm. with something relatively innocuous like falling down on a rock or a rock falling on them <laughs> yeah. and also yeah that if it was just done without warning with no battle or disaster or even accident that someone would just eliminate them entirely with no notice whatsoever I mean, a, a human at least is on some level aware that we can be injured and and die under even the most mundane circumstances. Yeah. Whereas a gem would not be because most of the time they can't be. So if you had some nasty gem or other being that could just go up to a gem, stab them in, stab them in the gemstone, and have them, yeah. I think that'd be pretty scary to them. Right, and then they would be having their form doing uncontrollable things like that have time to happen to amethyst and not be able to help themselves if they have no access to healing springs yeah well, stuff like that yeah have some withering withering away with no no recourse no no healing no help or just turning into just disappearing and turning into powder I think maybe when I really think about it one of the most horrific things that they have shown us, on screen is the concept of Lapis being powerless, but aware that she was in a mirror. And I could imagine that being a horrific concept too, of getting trapped somewhere, but you can't get out. And then you just never die. You're just stuck. Like, what if they just threw your gem into space and yeah. didn't do anything? <laughs> oh, just, you know, buried it. Right. You know, I just, it's, it's a little horrifying to think about when it, when it, race in science fiction is functionally immortal because you know if you can't do anything to actually end your life and it won't end naturally you can get trapped somewhere indefinitely or in a bad situation forever and there's just no end to it and that's i think that's one of the more horrifying things that i've seen in horror fiction is eternal trapping and lack of release from some kind of prison that you know you can't even end have it end by by a relatively quick death that we would get right? yeah they can't starve or dehydrate or age to death they just Suffocating. keep on going <laughs> right yeah that's a really disturbing concept i think so i wonder if i wonder if they have fiction so far i don't know of any you know presentations of it you know they're not canon but the comics for this series there was a little mini series about a character called the glass ghost which uh, it was a corrupted gem that everything it touched turned to glass. And, you know, it just wanted a hug, but it was just like walking around transforming others 
into glass and then they'd get stuck like that. So it's like, wow, that would be scary too. Especially yes. if they were like alive and aware while they were glass, but couldn't move. <laughs> yes. And that'd be pretty scary. That's what I can see as being fairly scary for humans and gems alike. Yeah. In the mini series, Pearl was very helpfully explaining that glass was not a gem. <laughs> <laughs> showed the chemical composition of it with one of her pearlograms as you call them that the chemical structure of glass is not even a gem i mean it can't be real but it was real. <laughs> and well ironic that she of all people should point out what isn't isn't a gem that's true <laughs> considering that she's had her say about organic bodies but pearls are made in organic creatures in the real world mm. hmm. yeah <laughs> yeah that's true so speaking of the gems, they did not appear. None of them appeared except Stephen. No, the other three didn't make so much as a cameo. We didn't even yeah, see the... Yeah, that's the first, isn't it? I think so. I think Yeah. we've skipped one or two of them at various times, but usually one shows up. We didn't see the beach house. Excuse me. We didn't see the beach house at all. That's right. Yeah, it started outside of the big donut and that's it. Yeah. I mean, except for the gem that was in the lighthouse we didn't see any other gems so, yeah i think i think that's the first time i mean they might be there for like a couple of scenes or like just a cameo in every other one but yeah there's at least one gem in every other one i'm pretty sure yeah like mm. other times even if it's just been the three of them saying we're off to do a mission and you can't come Stephen," which yeah explains why they're why they're there and why for why he's there and they're not whereas this time yeah. they figured we could grasp the concept of Stephen going out on his own Mm -hmm. Yeah, he just gets to go to horror movie parties and nobody asks him, you know, if he'll be staying out late. <laughs> uh, Pearl might have been standing there by his bed going, where is Steven? I want to watch him sleep. <laughs> <laughs> that could be a nightmare for you. <laughs> We're going to watch horror movies, Pearl. You can come with if you want. I have some dust to file. <laughs> yeah. I, I figure she's got a... That she of any of them would be could be scared by horror movies even if she wouldn't admit it yeah i'm pretty sure that amethyst would be into it and garnet would be impartial yeah Pearl would have reactions i mean based on kind of the only time i think we've seen them sitting around watching movies with the lonely blade thing that's kind of how it was as pearl had comments <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the other two were just like whatever <laughs> Mm. Yeah. I have a head cannon, and I don't think it comes from anywhere except my head that Garnet occasionally has trouble understanding that movies and such are completely not real. But we have seen her watch movies and things, so I think this is just something I developed on my own to give her a quirk. Oh, maybe. It might be hard to tell in context, like, whether a human story is a story or a documentary, <laughs> you know? I had something like that with a character from another dimension in one of my original things in webcomic I do, where uh, you know the character didn't speak the language and didn't know anything about the human world, but he was watching television and he eventually figured out that sports were not war and stuff like that. You know, just it's very, it's sometimes very hard to tell, is this an exaggerated thing or is this a documentary? Is this a nature show or is it a movie? Is it made up? So if you don't have full context, then it can be very confusing for an alien. <laughs> yeah, so they see seen her going, so the one about the healthcare service is real. The one about the crime-solving dog is not. Got that right? <laughs> I wonder what they think of, what was it she was watching, the Under the Knife show that Connie likes. Oh, if, <laughs> there's actually a Transformers character, which is the reverse. He's... He's obsessed with sports and understands them, but he treats everything he watches like it's a sporting match. There's a strip where he's watching one of those reality shows where people pick out pitch for each other and he's going, in chance. <laughs> That's so funny. They have a way of reacting and contextualizing everything in his, his sports. Yeah. That's hilarious. <laughs> That's great. So guess what? What? We don't have any music or any food. No, the music was fairly straightforward, bit of horror effect. and Yeah, I don't even know any names of background. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't bad, but it was very sort of down-the-line stuff to set the mood. Yeah. And, well, they, did, yeah, they didn't even have horror movie snacks. 
No, I'm like, come on, Ronaldo, just pop popcorn at least. Mm. That wouldn't have been a new recipe for me. But Sadie was drinking something in what looked like a coffee mug, but I didn't know what it was, so I didn't count it as a recipe. <laughs> so oh, maybe it was hot chocolate. <laughs> maybe it was Wait. blood. <gasps> no, maybe it was blood. No, <laughs> no, please don't have Sadie see really big a vampire. <laughs> Ugh. So I don't have anything else to talk about with regard to the supplemental categories of our podcast, except for factoids and merchandise. Don't have music or food. So disappointing. <laughs> if only I had known that. It's supported by Raven and Paul. Let me look up what the tagline was. Even goes to the lighthouse to watch scary movies with Ronaldo, Lars, and Sadie. Just says what happens. Yeah. <laughs> And then it actually was haunted, except it wasn't because it was a gem. <laughs> um, I guess that sense your mileage may vary as to whether that counts as haunting. The original title for this was longer when they first conceived it. So they called it Beach City Horror Club. And now it's just horror. Club. I guess they figured we knew we were in Beach City. I guess so. Let's see. the. Um, so I told you about the weird tagline re- referencing Teddy Ruxpin. So I think that the sort of a factoidy thing. And what else was factoidy about this episode? The, oh, I see. Now I thought of it, but then I lost it. Okay. Okay. This is, okay. Looking at Ronaldo's blog, they had a, you know, I've said before that sometimes he would post something, the people who run the blog would post something along with whatever was airing that week that was relevant. And this time they just posted a drawing of Lar- a child version of Lars and a child version of Ronaldo in a different Polaroid, like outside with their arms around each other. Oh. And it was, he just posted it on his blog and it was tagged TBT for Throwback Thursday. Yeah. It's kind of sweet <laughs> and a little sad. Yeah. Let's see. The only other thing I can think of is they had different, they had new voice actors for the young versions of those two characters. So. Oh yeah. I noticed that in the credits. Huh? I noticed that in the credits. I should give them a little shout out. Mason Cook did Young Lars and Bren- Brendan, was it? No, Braden Fitzgerald was Young Ronaldo. I looked the two of them up and they apparently are not really known as voice actors. They mostly do, both of them do TV and movies and stuff. And I think one of them did commercials, maybe both of them, but they're not really known for voice acting. They're, it was only kind of tangential in their resumes. It also credited them as credited them as Lighthouse. Really? Yeah, I think it might still be on the screen. So I guess that that were... that so they yeah, there was that one little bit where there were children laughing in the background. And I yeah, that's that was... Was... and the lighthouse gem or whatever spoke last name as well. So yeah. I guess that was them. Yeah, that's cool. Which makes the sense lighthouse. because that <laughs> that would have been the corrupted gem's main exposure to human sounds. Yes, so that's cool. <laughs> yeah. So, oh yeah, the the Polaroid that they had posted was it had like hand. It was supposed to be handwriting on it that said Beach City Explorer Club. So they were originally going to have an explorer club, and before Ronaldo decided, it was turned into a paranormal club because of what they experienced. <laughs> so the, the screen also credits Ian Jones Courtier's actor, who I assume is the "You're Eating My Leg" line. Ah, yeah, it had to be. <laughs> You're eating my leg. <laughs> That's great. Hmm. Yeah, I figure that they just kind of, anytime they have something like that, like with the voice actors for Lonely Blade and stuff, they just have somebody on staff do it. (laughs) Yeah, it's probably a lot of fun doing those. I think so. That would be cool. (laughs) I need to chew a bit of scenery. Yeah. Hey, kitty cat. Darius cat is making a cameo. Yeah. Okay, you're not in a meowing mood. Okay. Brand spanking new mint inbox. Do you want me to show you my merchandise for this time? Please do. I decided to go with the spooky theme. I have a couple of comic books for you where Steven Universe content was released in a couple of comics for Adventure Time and a Boom Spectacular. Kaboom? Is it Boom? Boom Studios. Ah, oh, um, I've heard of them, yeah. Yeah. So they stuck Steven Universe stuff in a couple of comics. Adventure Time, of course, is always related to Steven Universe yeah. because the same people worked on it in a lot of cases and that was where Rebecca got her mainstream I guess start but it says on it on the cover featuring a preview of the upcoming Steven Universe so I guess the comics were not out for Steven yet but it's called the 2013 Spooktacular Adventure Time issue and they had a couple of other things in it 
which the Stephen story in it, though, was not spooky whatsoever. It was just a short that has appeared in a couple other places. Probably just, uh, like you said, getting people excited for the upcoming series. Yeah, the story was written by Rebecca, but it's about Stephen looking at comic books. <laughs> And a shape-shifting gem disguises itself as one of his comic books. So the gems have to destroy all of his comics. Oh. Uh, so the gems make it up to him by writing, coloring, and drawing their own comic for him. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's kind of the weird, inept way that the gems sometimes make things up to him. They're just like, oh, we destroyed all your comics. So we'll draw you another one. Of course, he loves it. But I'm sure he wishes that his comics were not ripped to shreds. Yeah. There's this adorable thing where he's screaming, my Marion! <laughs> I've chopped that out and, and posted it in response to things occasionally. The Halloween Haunt from 2015 is does have something slightly more spooky in it, but it's actually, it makes no sense. It's like a section from another published one. They called it Wild Animals, and it's entirely about amethyst shape-shifting to break animals out of the pet store. <laughs> And she doesn't understand why she can't take the fish and dump them in the ocean because they'll die because they're freshwater. And she's just like, I was trying to free them. So she gets mad and just spends the evening shape-shifting into various things. It's pretty weird. <laughs> so I don't know. Those are the two spooky things, though. So You think it would be a series, a concept that would lend itself to sort of tongue-in-cheek spooky stuff? I think so. <laughs> Yeah, you could definitely have, I mean, like we did this time, some horror stuff happening with gems. So, uh, especially since they can shapeshift. And I mean, Amethyst could be a spooky, spooky monster. Oh, yeah. If, I wouldn't put it past Amethyst to pull a Halloween prank. Yeah. I've seen some Halloween costume ideas for the gems before, and they almost always have Amethyst transforming into like a werewolf or something. Oh, <laughs> werewolf Amethyst. I want to see that. <laughs> yeah, she would probably really enjoy Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, candy and costumes. Yeah. <laughs> mm. And she'd eat the candy bucket and all. Oh, absolutely. And all the wrappers. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah, given the way that she acted in the previous episode, she wouldn't save any for Steven. No. <laughs> you shouldn't have candy, Steven. It's bad for you. <laughs> no, that's okay. Garnet and Pearl would give him all of their candy. <laughs> Garnet would just be like, yeah, whatever makes Stephen happy. And Pearl just doesn't want to eat it. Mm. <laughs> Probably take a while to work out it's supposed to be food, that they're not just some strange tokens. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she would probably first get a list of all of the Halloween trick-or-treating rules from Stephen. Uh, yes. <laughs> and Garnet would just carry everyone when they got tired. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, she could be some kind of tall, scary monster. <laughs> I can see her for very sort of perfunctory, like, spooky mask that Stephen made her wear. <laughs> She'd just be walking around wearing just the mask. <laughs> but the elastic wouldn't be long enough to go around her giant head, so she'd just have it, like, sort of paper-clipped to her hair. <laughs> <laughs> be funny. <laughs> I should have used that as a probing question of what kind of Halloween costumes, but we've already discussed it. <laughs> I don't know what Pearl would do. <laughs> oh, who knows? She's very pale naturally, so she, maybe she could be like a vampire or something. Yeah, of course. She, she would make a good one of those white lady ghosts. Ah, <laughs> or she could be one of those alien gray creatures because they're usually spindly. Yeah, spindly, pale, and have big eyes. <laughs> yeah, she would probably be insulted if you told her that she looked like a different kind of creepy alien. She's like, no, I'm this kind of alien. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be funny. <laughs> yeah, that's all I got for our not really Halloween, but sort of Halloweeny episode. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I do agree, though. I think this would make the perfect Halloween diversion episode. But yeah. even by now, I know that Stephen Universe scheduling is not even what they set it out to be when they make the show. So it could have started out that way. It could have started mm -hmm. out as a Halloween episode and ended up when it did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Most likely. I heard that in a couple of other countries, it did air near Halloween, but not the United States, <laughs> not as a premiere. <laughs> yeah, I, I had no idea when it aired here. I guess it would have. I'm not even sure who screens it normally apart from the streaming services. Yeah, I don't know either. Uh, well, we'll have to see if, if the holiday theme continues past this. <laughs> if they, they get a Christmas or a Thanksgiving or whatever. <laughs> yeah, we shall see.
Shall we wrap this one? Yeah, let's wrap this one. Let's wrap our, our non-Halloween Halloween. And then we'll see every, all of our listeners next time. Next time for, what's next time? What are we watching next? Oh, winter forecast. I remember from last time now. Winter forecast. Uh, something winter, post-fall. <laughs> yeah, that fits with the time of year thing, yeah. Yeah, moving into winter at least. Well, but that will be for the next one. Until then, people. Thank you for listening. (laughs) You've been listening to Ivy and Daria on Not So Giant Women. You can find episodes of the show in video form by looking up Not So Giant Women on YouTube or in audio form at anchor.fm slash not so giant women or your podcatcher of choice. You can also find us on Facebook. Audio production by Daria. Video production and music by Ivy. Daria can also be heard on Postploitation, the Ozploitation podcast. And Ivy at her Steven Universe fan blog at love-takes-work.tumblr.com. Steven Universe was created by Rebecca Sugar and remains property of Cartoon Network. No infringement is intended.